Hi, and welcome to the History and Systems of Psychology. I am your professor, Dr. Daniel McConnell. And uh, this first uh, set of narrated slides for Chapter 1 is going to serve mainly as just kind of an introduction and overview and a little bit of a uh, kind of a primer on some of the key ideas in this class. Uh, so let's just start by asking a, a simple question, which is, why do we want to study the history of psychology? And I know it's probably a cliche to cite uh, George Santayana, who is the guy who gives us this quote, those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. But um, it's important, I think, especially from the perspective of science, to really think about what that means. Because in the history of pretty much all sciences, there have been questions that have been asked in the past that turned out to be problematic for various reasons. And we're going to see the same is true in psychology that that questions about the nature of human behavior and the human mind uh, have taken all kinds of shapes and forms over the last, say, 2,500 years or so. And uh, so we want to look at some of those and understand what the nature of those questions were and why, did, why were they questions framed the way they were and what were the possible answers people proposed and which ones kind of worked out and which ones kind of had to die off. And, and we want to understand that because we don't want to perhaps start repeating the same kinds of questions, reinventing the wheel, or going down dead-end roads that we know are going to be fruitless. Another kind of, I think, valuable aspect of a class like this is that if you think about psychology as a, as a major, it's kind of a strange one, right? It's different than a lot of other ones because there's not a lot of building on previous material. Think about how a general psychology class is organized, the first psychology class you take. There's there's really just, say, 16 or 17 chapters of different kinds of subfields in psychology, right? It usually is something like a, a brain and behavior chapter, and then a sensation perception chapter, and then a consciousness chapter, and a learning chapter, memory, cognition, language, intelligence, and then social psychology, personality psychology, abnormal, all these different subfields and specializations each get a chapter. And then after that, you just start taking a bunch of different classes, each one, 3,000, 4,000 level classes, uh, that kind of takes any one of those chapters and expands it out into more detail. So you can take the cognitive psychology class, you can take the perception class, the personality class, physiological psychology, and so on and so forth, right? And, and, and everyone takes a different kind of sampling of each one of these classes, so it's kind of like a smorgasbord of a major, and, and uh, there's no order that you have to take things in, so no professor can ever assume you've ever had a particular class in the past, except for the general psych class. So sometimes it's it's kind of difficult to to connect the dots right and to step back and to use another cliche to see the forest instead of the trees right because what is it that all these classes have in common what are some of the overarching broader themes and questions in psychology and a class like this kind of helps us see some of those things to be able to as i said step back and see the bigger picture now I was suggesting that there are there's about 2,500 years or so worth of questions of philosophy or yeah related to philosophy of mind questions about human behavior and the human mind, and um, that's going to be a, a chunk of what this class is about. And you might be asking yourself, why philosophy? This is not a philosophy class; it's a psychology class. But again, questions that deal with the nature of the mind uh, began as philosophical questions, right? They were not questions that could be empirically tested, right? But at some point, ballpark, say, eighteen mid-1800s, um, some of these questions actually began to be uh, empirical questions, that is, scientific questions, things that can be tested through observation. Prior to that, it was more about argumentation and using logic to support a particular viewpoint about, about uh, mind. Uh, so we could say that these philosophical questions became scientific ones, at which point psychology emerged as an actual scientific field. Uh, I guess I'm being glib by refer to it, referring to it here as a scientific philosophy, but you know you can uh, kind of see what I mean. I think that because these questions eventually turned into ones that are scientific in nature. So for the rest of these notes, what I want to do is I want to kind of give a broad overview of some of the major philosophical themes, some of the major overarching topics here. And what we're going to end up doing is revisiting these in subsequent chapters uh, in more detail with specific uh, examples of, of viewpoints relating to each one of these. But I want to treat this as kind of a primer on some of these key terms, and you can refer back to this as well as chapter one in the book to give you that, uh, give you that overview. 
So first we have two major types of philosophy. There are others, but these are going to be re relevant to our purposes uh, as a philosophy of mind. So the first is metaphysics. Metaphysics, if you think about that word, physics is the study of, physical, of the physical world, right? The science of physics. But metaphysics, meta means kind of about or above, and, and it's really questions about the physical world, including whether or not the world as we know it really is a physical reality. So the, any question that gets at things like, what's the true nature of reality? What's the true nature of the universe? What exists? What's real? What's the essential substance of reality? What's, what's the universe made of? These are metaphysical questions. And then there's epistemology, which is a philosophy that deals with the nature of knowledge, right? What is, what, 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 what is human knowledge? Ideas, what are they? Where do they come from? How do, we, how do we obtain knowledge? These are epistemological questions, which probably have a little more obvious bearing on psycho psychology, but metaphysics is relevant to psychology as well, as we will see here on the next slide. Two examples of metaphysical theories are these two isms here, and as I always joke, we're going to have 700 and some isms in this class. Um, but the, the basic idea here for dualism is a metaphysical theory that says that there are two realities, right? That's du dual for two here, right? So there is a mental reality, and then there is a, I label it here, a body reality, but we can think of it as an external physical reality. So I'm pointing in here to say a mental reality, but I'm not necessarily pointing in my head in my, to my brain, but rather I'm su suggesting that there is some sort of internal experiential reality that is different from the external physical reality. So this kind of definition of mind separates it from the body, right? Because the body is part of that physical reality, the brain is part of that physical reality, but mind is seen as somehow different. Mind is just idea or experience or maybe it's more ethereal or ghost-like in some ways, and therefore it's very different than the body and the rest of the physical thing. These are di very different, very disconnected sorts of things. But on the other hand, you could be a monist instead. And, and with monism, the prefix here, mono, means one. So there's now only one reality, not two. So we have to pick one of them, right? Pick, pick body, pick mind. So for materialism, we're saying that everything is made of matter, right? That's why it's called materialism. Solid physical matter is the underlying essence of reality. So this eliminates that experiential ghost-like mind and replaces it with matter. So here we have to suggest that mind must be the brain, right? It's, it's some kind of a physical event in the brain. This word physical pops up a lot because often a synonym for materialism is often used as physicalism. Uh, so mind, body, all the same. It's all physical reality. Or you could get rid of physical reality and replace it with just a mental reality. And that's what idealism is all about. Ideas are the basis of reality. Ideas are reality. There is no independent physical world that exists separate from ideas. It is all just ideas in the mind. Mind is real. This takes us into what we famously know, and maybe you've heard in some other psychology classes, is the mind-body problem, right? And this is a problem that actually arises as a consequence of adopting this dualist view. When we adopt a, a definition of mind and body as being very different from each other, where we say the body is made of a physical material, right, but the mind is not, so its opposite is immaterial, right? So the body is material and the mind is immaterial. Again, it's made of experience or thoughts or ideas which are ethereal and ghost-like. Right? Now the question is, how do these manage to interact with each other? Because we assume that this must take place because we suggest that the mind perhaps controls the body, right? One, one example of this would be that I have the idea that I want to do something. I want to pick up an object. I have this pen in my hand, so I'm going to say my idea was that I wanted to pick up the pen. So this begins as an idea in the mind, so again, it's an ethereal idea, but this idea has to cause something to happen in the body, right? It has to, to cause some, uh, some, some event, some movement in the, in the brain, which will then trigger a movement uh, in nerves, which triggers a movement in the muscles, which triggers a movement of the arm to reach out and pick up the object. Now, when we think about how movement occurs, we resort to 
physics, right? We understand, say, in a basic term, Newton and Newton's three laws of motion explain how movement occurs. And so one example, the second law, force equals mass times acceleration. So the object is the mass, and I'm trying to accelerate it, so this means I have to apply a force to cause it to move, right? How does the mind apply or impart a force onto a physical object? Sometimes we refer to this as the problem of the ghost and the machine, right? The body is like the machine and the ghost is in there trying to control it, but it's the Casper the Friendly Ghost problem. If you've seen that cartoon, the idea is that Casper kind of appears to people, but he is otherwise so ghostly that he cannot really interact with physical reality, right? He cannot pick up an object, his hand passes through it. He cannot open the door, his walk that he walks through the door, right? He is immaterial and he cannot really interact in any obvious direct way with material substances. So if the mind is going to be defined as an immaterial thing, how does it apply a force to a material substance like the body? Well, we don't have an answer to that. That's why this is called the mind-body problem. Of course, there's also the other issue here. The other side of this problem is that once I reach out and grab the pen, I feel it in my hand, right? So now that I have this sort of physical sensation, of, of being in contact with an external object, that sensory data has to come in through the sensory nerves up the spine and into the brain. But again, that's still part of the physical reality. At some point, it has to jump from the brain back into the mind where it becomes my, my experience, my consciousness, and my awareness that I am, in fact, holding a pen. Right? So that's the other side. It's a two-way street. Right? So the first, the question, the first question is, how does the mind control and cause the body to do anything? And then how does the body provide the information back to the mind? It's a problem that we don't have a solution for. In chapter four, we will look at some examples of these. And here is a couple of isms that uh, fall under the major heading of epistemology, right? So questions about the nature of knowledge. Where does knowledge come from? And the two competing views here are rationalism and empiricism. So rationalism, the word rational means logical, right? So one of the hallmarks of this is to suggest that ultimately knowledge can only be arrived at through reason and logic, right? That's, that's some kind of key special aspect of the human mind is that we are capable of reason and logic. And so this is an important thing to, to, the, to the philosophers, especially amongst the ancient Greeks, who felt that this was a special ability that uh, perhaps was even divinely endowed with us, that we have the capacity to reason through and understand the true nature of reality uh, through, through reasoning. Uh, so this idea that there is some sort of innate uh, element to our abilities, whether it's just the innate ability to use logic or whether we might actually be born with some form of innate knowledge about what's real and what's true, um, that's a rationalist viewpoint. So the key point here is that the rationalists don't really trust the senses. And we're going to see a lot of that in chapter two, that anytime you see somebody saying they don't trust the senses, there are problems with the senses, uh, you're, you're going to see that that's taking a, a rationalist point of view. So the empiricists then, in contrast to that, are the ones who say that knowledge can, in fact, and does come only from the senses. So they argue the famous were born a blank slate, right, from John Locke and others saying that but we have, have no innate knowledge. Better than the blank slate metaphor, I kind of like uh, the white paper metaphor. So in this case, John Locke actually wrote, uh, the mind is like a, a sheet of white paper, devoid of all content or characters at, at our birth. And instead, the pen of experience writes upon it. So the idea is that there's nothing uh, that we are endowed with at birth. We, we just uh, start getting sensation, sensory input. And that is the, the foundation of all knowledge, is the accumulation of all of our uh, sensory ideas. You can kind of see here how that first discussion post that I have assigned uh, related to, uh, is there anything that you can think of that was not first uh, a sensory experience, is related to these kinds of questions. Because if you're an empiricist, you're going to say all knowledge, every idea that you have, uh, ultimately boils down to some kind of previous sensory experience. Even if it's something you haven't personally experienced, you still know about it through stories or images or anything else that you've seen that tell you about it, right? That's, and that's how you know about it. But on the other hand, the rationalist would say that, no, maybe there are some things in the human mind 
that do not reduce to previous sensory experiences, right? And that in fact relate to uh, something that maybe we know innately, just never learn. So clearly with, with empiricism, we, we need to talk about how the senses work. So the beginnings of, of psychology really emerge here from the empiricist view because the study of sensation and perception, one of those classes and chapters you take, uh, that's, um, that's, that's only going to be relevant if you're an empiricist. The rationalists say we don't need to worry about how the senses function. The senses aren't really telling us what's real. Inner knowledge is what's real. And likewise, studying learning, right? how does learning work? That's, that's something that comes from empiricism. Another major philosophical question here, I'm labeling it here as knowledge and reality, but we'll also call it the problem of universals. I'll explain why it's called that here in a second. But the, the question is this, the ideas that we have that exist here in the mind, are they real? That is, do they correspond to things that are real? So again, I could have the idea of something like this pen, and I could ask the question, well, I have an idea of the pen, that it exists in my mind now, and I can think about it even when it's not in front of me, when I can't see it. Um, so I have the idea, and I would ask the question, okay, the idea is real because it's in my head, but is the pen real? That is, is, does the idea actually correspond to some external thing? And in the case of this, we'd probably say, sure, okay, yeah. Um, but what if we deal with less simple, concrete kinds of things like this, and we deal with more abstract topics? Right? And this is why it's called the problem of universals, because the universals are seen as these generalities and abstractions. So let's consider a, a, an object uh, or a concept like beauty, right? I have the idea of what beauty is. It's a little difficult to define, um, but I, we, we all seem to be able to understand what it means. And, and oftentimes we will look at things and we will say, that's beautiful, right? It could be a person, it could be a song, a, a work of art, a, a flower, a, a mountain, whatever, right? But there are many different kinds of things that we might say are beautiful. And now the question is, is that real? So you've heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. What we're basically saying in this view is that really that's just an idea in the mind, right? That the things that we might label as beautiful are not actually inherently in any objective way beautiful. Beauty is not a real property of things in the world. Beauty is only an idea in the mind, right? So if you want to be a realist, you would say that, yes, beauty is actually in some way some actual essence of these things. It's real. It's part of those real things. But on the other hand, if you're a nominalist, the word nominalist here means nom means name. So we say that these are just ideas that exist only in the names that we give them. So we come up with the word beauty and we agree to label certain things beautiful, but this is really just a form of shared human knowledge, right? We're talking about uh, what we call a social construct, right? We basically say we're all going to agree to use this word to, to, to name this thing, but the category of the thing that we're naming is really just uh, an invention of the human mind. One example of that, here's another example, a little more concrete perhaps, is think about a circle and have you ever seen a circle? And when I ask this in a face-to-face -face classroom, a lot of students think that I'm joking or coming up with a trick question. Well, it's kind of a trick. The point is that think about what a circle is and how it's defined. Right? A circle is defined as a, as a, as a perfectly round two-dimensional form that has a constant radius all 360 degrees around. And on top of that, it has an area of pi r squared and a few other geometric principles. Go back to geometry class to remember all that stuff. Um, the point is, is, this is a sort of an idealized geometric perfection. How do you fit pi, which is this ever-repeating irrational number, inside a bounded form anyway? That's kind of weird. Um, but then that's the point. It is kind of difficult to understand how that geometric uh, perfection can be the same as uh, an actual circle that we see. And it's not, right? And in fact, when you think about all of the circles that you have ever seen, they are in some way imperfect, right? Even though we can draw really good ones in geometry textbooks, they're still imperfect in various ways. And outside of those, the ones that we draw by hand are going to be imperfect in more obvious ways. The point is, is that we've never seen a perfect circle. So how did we ever get this knowledge in the first place? So again, this relates back to epistemological questions about where did it come from? Maybe you were born with it, so you'd say maybe you're a rationalist in that case. 
Um, but in the end, we are still, uh, in this, for this point of view, for the, the problem of universals, we're asking, is there even really such a thing as a perfect circle? Maybe the world contains only imperfect circles, and that the idea of a, a perfect circularity is just an idea, an invention of the human mind. And so that's a nominalist to you. But on the other hand, if you want to say that there really are perfect circles out there, uh, then you're going to be a realist. That is the end of chapter one. Thank you.